Hi everyone, I want to take a couple of minutes just to talk to you about Winthrop and Bradford. So William Bradford, he believed that God had set some men over others and that each should serve his ordered place. And this makes a lot of sense and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and these are a couple of quotes from him. Others of best discerning, the governor and better part, the aged and graver men. So Bradford writes the history of Plymouth, and he does this to record the experiences and show the greatness of their accomplishments. He wants to illustrate God's grand design for the pilgrims and to confirm their place among the elect. And he wants to encourage cohesiveness of a pilgrim family and to show newcomers how much they owed to the pilgrims. Now remember, the pilgrims are the separatists. They do not believe that there's any um, ability to salvage the uh, English church. They just want to separate completely from it. So he's sort of setting up this grand narrative of their origins and, and how they came to be and what they accomplished when they came to America. Some of the literary devices that he uses. He selects specific details and episodes that support his beliefs. So he doesn't talk about things that don't um, support what he wants people to think and feel about the pilgrims. He emphasizes the president presence of God. We already know that that's very much a Puritan thing. And he emphasizes how pious the pilgrims are. He organizes events according to his view of divine providence rather than sequential. Um, and he lacks personal details to emphasize the elevated position of the Puritans. So this is really important. Not only is he cherry picking what he talks about in pilgrim history. He also is uh, dividing or determining when the events occurred um, without any historical connection. So he's determining, he's writing history, only um, not the history that as it actually occurred, but as um, history that will represent his beliefs and his, um, get across his message. He uses doublets and he does this to echo um, the Bible. He wants to, to sound like biblical verse um, in his tale of the Puritans. Um, he reproduces the tempo of repetition of spoken words. That's what doublets do. Um, and to create a sense of continuity and to add gravity and emphasis. So it's really something to um, kind of uh, push forward your point, manners and customs. We don't really need to say manners and customs because those really mean the same thing. Hunted and persecuted, pride and ambition, fair and beautiful, wealth and riches. You can see that he's really just uh, more or less repeating himself, but he's doing this for emphasis um, in a very contrived manner. It's not just uh, for the fun of it. <laughs> So um, Bradford is very famous for this uh, uh, phrase. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I apologize. As one small candle will light a thousand, so the light here candle, kindled hath shone to many, yea, to our whole nation. So what he's saying basically is, you know, he, the, the Puritans, um, the, the pilgrims rather, the separating Puritans, the pilgrims, um, are uh, started a light to shine across the entire nation, to shine across entire America um, because of their faith and, and their beliefs and, and the great works that they have done. So he has, um, uh, and you know, uh, not, not to, um, to uh, uh, deride him, but he has a very strong ego. This makes sense because my goodness, you know, they've come across um, the Atlantic Ocean and survived and done so much as a community that it makes a great deal of sense. Um, you got to have some kind of strong ego, strong belief in yourself in order to be able to accomplish so much. So it only makes sense that he um, applies that to his religious beliefs. 
Next we have John Winthrop. And Winthrop is about the same time um, uh, as, as Bradford, but he settles in the Massachusetts Bay Area. And he, um, he is the Puritan who he wants to reform the church. He does not want to separate it. So again, it's broken, let's fix it. That's the Puritans. The pilgrims are, it's broken, let's just get rid of it and start all over again. He persuaded Charles I to give him permission to emigrate to the New World in 1629, and he was selected by his um, shipmates to be governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony in England, and he served in that position for 20 years. So he was very well loved and respected um, by his people. And that, that's, again, something that you want uh, in your leader when you're establishing a new world. So some themes that you will find in a model of Christian charity. Unity and love are essential for success of the Puritan colony. Um, this makes a lot of sense because it, you, they are so dependent on each other to exist, to survive. So uh, they can't be hating on each other. They've got to be supporting each other um, and be unified, be a unified group in order to succeed. And, and again, that makes sense for the second theme, which is the rights of the individual must be secondary to the good of the group. If their colony is going to survive, it has to be good for everyone. It can't be, you know, Mr. Uh, Smith down the street uh, wants to uh, be a pig farmer, but we already have three pig farmers, so we really need him to grow corn or to um, uh, herd cattle or something like that. So it wasn't, it, it had to be good for everyone, not just what was good for you. And there was higher, and the other final or other main theme is that hierarchical society was necessary for the maintenance of a Christian community. So there had to be leaders, there had to be people in charge, there had to be religious um, folks. So that's a little bit different than what we see going on with the pilgrims. Um, but in uh, in the, at the Massachusetts Bay Colony, we see that the Puritan leaders own large estates and are considered to be the great ones. Again, remember we have predestination, we have the innate depravity of man, so we've also got these underlying themes at work here as well. Um, so additional themes, they are a company of Christ bound together by love. And, you know, again, that whole love and unity thing is really essential if they are going to be successful. Um, if they are not working together, they're not going to make it in this new world. Um, and there is a need for unity, the need for wifely submission, the virtue of obedient citizens, and the errors and objections of young heads in the country. So you'll see... Um, in a model of Christian charity, it's his emphasis is so much on people working together. Um, everybody has a role, everybody has a job, and they have to do their jobs in order for the whole world to survive. And this is a representative government. It is not a government of the mob. So it's not everybody decides. It's not a democracy in that sense, um, but it is in the sense that you have a representative who goes and speaks to John Winthrop and says, you know, the, a group of people are thinking about this, and then Winthrop would decide, uh, along with other important people in the community, whether or not that um, was the right thing to do. And this whole concept of predestination also um, is a kind of a, a support or an explanation that there are some rich people, there are some poor people, some people are born high and important, others are uh, meant to be um, in subjection, they're meant to serve. So for example, women were born to serve men, that was what they were there to do. Um, and as I said in uh, the earlier video, the women were meant to take care of the children, take care of the men, they were meant to be subservient. That was their purpose and their role. 
and again, not to support those beliefs, but you can understand, I mean, if you think of it, these pilgrims or these, I'm sorry, Puritans landed at the Massachusetts Bay Colony and there was nothing there. So they've gone through these, I think it was two months or three month journey across the ocean. You know, many people died. There was a lot of sickness. Um, living in qu close quarters with one another, and they arrive at their destination, but there isn't anything warm and fuzzy waiting for them. They have to build their homes. There's no homes there. There's no heat or electricity. Um, they, ha they don't have, um, you know, a grocery store to go to. They have to um, grow their own food. So it wasn't like, um, you know, you finally get to your destination and then, oh, we can make this brave new world. It's no, you have to create it from the very basic um, of, of having a roof over your head. So um, it was a really daunting task. And in order for them to be successful, they needed to have that kind of belief of working together and supporting each other. So some of Winthrop's beliefs. Um, again, that there are distinctions or different differences are divinely ordained because God has made all creatures different. Again, each person has um, strengths and weaknesses, and those are preordained by God and predetermined by God. And your job is to um, do your best at whatever you have been ordained to do. Um, and again, the distinctions in wealth and power um, help God's spirit work by restraining the wicked, whether they are rich or poor, and exercising his graces, both in the greater ones and in the poor and inferior sort. So the, uh, also the distinctions in wealth and power show God's glorious power to bestow gifts on those who are um, uh, predestined to have gifts bestowed upon them. So this whole concept of predestination, it's pretty complex. Um, it's not just about who's going to heaven. It's, you know, who has a better life, um, who has an easier life, who has a particular job. Um, so it's really intimately interwoven into their life. If you want more information, you can check out the, those links there. Um, that's where I've gotten a lot of my information for these Puritan lectures. So. There you go, and I will talk to you again soon.